be a flamingo in a flock of pigeons. So what I want to talk about today is um, the importance of creativity in the classroom, you know, both for us as um, teachers uh, and also for our learners. So I'm a passionate believer in the power of creativity to uh, really make the world a better place, um, but also to, for it to um, make learning more effective and uh, deeper and more meaningful for our, for our learners. So um, I've called it Be a Flamingo in a Flock of Pigeons because what I want to be able to do is to encourage you um, as teachers to sometimes in your lessons just have that confidence to do things a little bit differently, you know, um, to be that flamingo in your classroom. Um, and creativity takes that courage, you know, it takes that confidence. Uh, and a lot of the time when we're under pressure, you know, uh, we're under all sorts of pressures nowadays, but maybe we've got far too many hours um, of teaching to teach in the week, or we, uh, we've got to move all of our classes online onto Zoom, we've got to get through this huge syllabus um, and uh, you know, work online. All of these pressures pile up and it's really easy for um, creativity to be one of the first things that gets cut, you know, because um, it's risky. We, we can't be sure that it's gonna work. Um, it takes sometimes that little bit of extra effort. Um, and yet it's so uh, important. It can be so valuable to our classes. So what I'm gonna try and persuade you is that um, even just a short amount, even just a small activity, a little twist or a tweak, uh, maybe even to a very standard um, activity that you use a lot in your classrooms, um, is going to be really valuable to you. Uh, and I'm going to share some very practical activities about how we can do that. So yes, starting off with the strong foundation of our syllabus, but how we can work with that, be a little bit flexible um, and be more creative uh, in our classes. So um, be a flamingo in a flock of pigeons. I want to um, start off with thinking about what creativity means to you? What does it mean to you um, as a teacher when we talk about being creative in the classroom? Um, and I'm gonna ask you just to put uh, your uh, answers to that question in the chat box. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna try and get this screen to work so that I can see the chat. So bear with me, but just write your answers please in the chat box. Um, what does creativity in the classroom mean to you? Planning and delivering lessons that engage students. Going beyond expectations, thinking outside the box, trying new experiences, connecting to the outside world. Oh, lovely. Lifting activities from the book and taking risks, really important. Not being boring, absolutely. Uh, exploring new fields, wonderful. Okay. Right, hopefully. <laughs> okay, I can see all of your answers now. So sorry about that little technical hitch. As you all know, we need to be able to think on our feet and be flexible. So hopefully this is working now. Adapting your textbook to your students, brilliant. Um, so I agree with all of those. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about what, what it means to me. I've, I've um, been thinking a lot about this over the last few years, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the idea of big C versus little C creativity where big C creativity um, refers to the geniuses, you know, Picasso, Mozart, Leonardo da Vinci, people whose creativity was literally groundbreaking um, and very much shaped the world that we live in. 
um, as opposed to the other end of the scale, which is little c creativity, where little c creativity refers to the smaller things, you know, the little things that you do every day that are creative acts. So you might um, arrange some flowers in a vase and put them on your table. Um, that's an act of creativity. Perhaps you uh, cook up some leftovers that you had from your meal last night and you, um, you, know, you adapt a recipe. Uh, that's creativity. You, you take a photo of your lunch and you post it on Instagram. Um, all of those are kind of little examples of little c creativity. Uh, but there are two more C's that I just want to mention that come from um, a, a model of creativity put forward by Bagetta and Kaufman. Um, and they talk about pro-C and mini-C. So pro-C, um, I think very much stands for itself. That's, that's professional C, um, a kind of expert creativity. So uh, if you think of a professional artist, or a professional musician, somebody who's developed their skills in a particular area and they've become very proficient, they're professional. They might not have reached eminent status yet, you know, the big C, um, but they're on the way. So uh, I think we can probably safely say that everybody in this room, in this Zoom room today, uh, we can all consider ourselves pro C experts when it comes to the area of teaching language, teaching English. Um, and then really importantly for us um, as teachers is this um, idea of mini C. So mini C um, is a kind of interpretative creativity. So this is the creativity that's involved in the learning process. When you learn something new, um, you, you use this uh, mini C. The definition of it is um, the novel and personally meaningful interpretation of experiences, actions, and events. So when you have a learner in your classroom and they experience something which is novel, which is new to them, and which is meaningful, um, they will remember that. It will become a part of their learning. So this is absolutely key uh, to what we're doing in the classroom. Um, so when uh, the learning is meaningful, um, it becomes memorable. Uh, and that's what we're looking at. When it's meaningful, it becomes memorable. Now, another way to make things memorable uh, is to make them a little bit different. So things that are unusual um, or, or quirky or you know, out of the ordinary stick out in our minds. They stick out in our memory. Um, and this is really useful in the classroom. You know, uh, imagine you're looking at a flock of pigeons and you see a flamingo. That's going to stand out and you'll remember it. Uh, if you think about um, the way we conduct our lessons, a lot of the time we're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, the, a lot of the lessons have the same kind of format. Um, and as a result, it's easy for it to kind of blur into one long stream. You know, it's difficult to pick out um, individual episodes in our memory. So in order to engage our learners' attention, Sometimes we need to be able to switch things up and just do things um, a little bit differently uh, so that it helps um, them to stand out in their, in their memory. Um, for example, you might be teaching some language, okay, some phrases like um, have a cup of coffee or have a cup of tea. And so you use the pictures that come in your course book um, to help the learners understand these phrases. And that's absolutely fine. Or you could shake it up a bit and perhaps find a picture of a flamingo having a cup of coffee or an elephant having a cup of tea. And immediately these images are going to be more memorable. So you're going to be here. It's a long day today. You've got lots of talks all throughout the day. It's quite possible that this evening you won't remember very much about anything that uh, certainly that I said in this session. Um, but I can guarantee that when you think back, you're quite likely to remember the picture of the flamingo. You know, Antonio was talking about a flamingo having a coffee. Um, okay, so let's look at practical ways that we can do this in the classroom then, in our lessons. Uh, and I'm gonna start off with an activity, um, again, that is a kind of uh, a, a twist on, on, a, on an activity which I'm sure is already very familiar to you. Uh, so, I call this activity Show and Imagine, uh, and it's based on one of my favorite possessions, 
which is this uh, vase that you can see on your screen. The orange vase there, that's a painting that I did of it. Um, so this is one of my favorite possessions. Uh, and what I'd like you to do is to just guess, okay? Put your ideas in the chat box for where do you think I got it and why is it important to me? Um, and let's see what ideas you can come up with. Where did you get it and why is it important to me? Market on the island of Crete, very nice. <laughs> I had to buy an extra suitcase. Oh, nice. Got it for my travels abroad. Important because it represents joy to you. Lovely. In Africa, I exchanged it for something else. Nice idea. Present from my boyfriend. Mm, wishful thinking. <laughs> Great, good memories of a sunny holiday. Ah, in Provence, like Suzanne. Nice, lovely ideas. Okay, I'm gonna tell you the story in a minute um, of how I got the vase. But first of all, I'm gonna explain the activity uh, to you. So what we do in this activity is um, we, uh, normally I, I just draw a picture uh, of the possession. So I showed you a painting before, but um, it doesn't have to be you know, a painting, it can be a very simple line drawing that you can do. So you draw a picture of your favorite possession um, and students are going to do this as well. Now, sometimes uh, people will say, well, I don't really have a favorite possession. Um, well, that's okay. You can maybe draw a pet um, if you want to, but, but no humans. So no people are allowed in this activity. Uh, and then the idea is that you show your picture to your partner. Um, now, obviously I don't have a partner here today and I could pull someone out of the audience, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so we'll adapt it. But you show your picture to your partner um, and they have to imagine, so you have to imagine that this object is now your object. So I want you to imagine that, that yellow, the orange vase that I just showed you is actually your object. Um, and I want you to make up the backstory. So you think about um, how you got that vase and why it's important to you. So you can be thinking about that while I tell you. Um, and then you put the students into pairs and they have to tell their story to their partner. Um, so uh, you came up some, with ideas about why the vase was important to me. I want you to imagine it's your vase now um, and I can't do it as a speaking activity where you tell me the story, but perhaps just put some ideas in the chat. Um, if it's your vase, where did you get it? Uh, and why is it important to you? Let's see if you can do a, a one-line story in the chat. Tell me your stories. Camden Market, nice idea. <laughs> Lovely, Joanne, really nice. Camden Market, I saw this beautiful vase, couldn't resist it. Ordered at a flea market in London. Handed down by your grandmother, nice. It's the first thing you painted when you started a painting class. Really nice. You pretended a monster lived in it, your grandfather. Okay, so you get the idea. You come up with a story about the vase, uh, and I listen to the story and I say, oh yeah, very interesting. Okay, would you like to hear the real story now? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna tell you the real story of the vase and help me, here it is. This is the vase. Um, and this vase actually belonged to my great grandmother. Um, and I remember as a little girl, I would visit her house and she would often have roses um, from her garden, she grew a lot of roses and she would put them in the vase and keep them on the table. Um, uh, and I remember it there. 
Um, now, my great grandmother lived with my great grandfather, who was an artist. Um, in fact, he was an artist in pre war Germany. Um, and he, uh, as a result of you know, what was going on in Germany, he had to leave. Uh, in fact, because he did a lot of propaganda art, um, anti propaganda art. So, so he left Germany, uh, traveled across Europe, um, and ended up uh, in the UK where. Uh, he met my great grandmother. Um, he was an artist and he had a shed in his garden. And I remember um, as a little girl, I would go into that shed where he did his painting and I can remember the smell of the oil paint. Um, and I'm sure that that was one of the early influences um, in me wanting to, to you know, be an artist when I was older, which is something that I'm still working on. So um, yeah, I have very happy memories of, of visiting them. Um, this vase, I don't know where it actually came from. I know they traveled a lot around Europe, so perhaps they picked it up on one of their travels. Um, but I know that for me, I don't know if my great grandfather ever painted it, um, but for me, it has become one of the kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? It's one of the uh, things that I often choose to put in my, in my paintings. Uh, so there's the real story. So some of you were quite close, right? Um, so that's how the activity works. And as you can see, um, you can do it with a drawing or you could um, use the real object. So what is it um, that, uh, that I like about an activity like this? Okay, let's just think about what was going on. And for me, there are two things here. There are two parts to this activity that really appeal. One is the drawing um, and the second is the story behind it. So drawing, first of all, I will often use a little drawing activity um, as part of a speaking task. You know, before you ask your students to talk about their weekend, maybe get them to draw something that happened on their weekend. It, it gets them, it kind of takes them out of their, um, gets them to think outside the box slightly. Uh, and it also gives them thinking time. It gives them time to come up with the story. Um, and the story is open ended, you know, it, it involves a bit of creativity to kind of come up with that story. Uh, and this links in with, um, we know from uh, Zoltan Dornier's work on motivation, that this idea of a, a creative, open ended task um, requires more investment from the learner. They're more invested in the story because they've drawn something, they've thought about it, they've put their ideas together. Um, and that is going to be motivating for them. Uh, and then secondly, we have um, the element of storytelling, so the narratives. Now, um, learner narratives, the stories that we um, tell each other about our lives are incredibly powerful, um, uh, powerful vehicles for learning, okay? They're these wonderful kind of conveyors of, of meaning um, and therefore provide really ideal language learning opportunities. Um, so think about how often in our lives we tell the same stories, okay, I hope it's not just me, uh, but we tend to tell the same stories about ourselves again and again. So working on learner narratives, giving our, our learners the opportunities to tell these stories about themselves um, is, is really useful, it helps to build up their, their sense of um, identity in the new language. Uh, so it's a very important part of what we do in the lesson. There's a lovely quote by Maria Rukeyser who says, the universe is made up of stories, not atoms. Um, now, obviously, it's, it's made up of both, but I think it's interesting to think about how um, often it's very hard for us to remember facts, uh, but we do tend to remember someone's stories. Okay, so we have the drawing, we have the stories, uh, the narratives, um, there's a, a real sense of engagement, okay? I think um, we could see from the chat that when, when somebody tells a story or when you're coming up with a story yourself, um, the learners are really engaged in what's going on. They actually genuinely want to find out um, what happened in the story. There's also this effort of the imagination. So, so the um, effort that's involved uh, when you had to come up with your own story, okay, to um, to think about, you know, why would the vase have been important to you? Where did you get it? Um, simply that effort, the cognitive effort of coming up with a story 
will help to um, embed the learning, to help make the learning deeper uh, and more effective. Um, we have this idea of tweaking the familiar. Okay, so obviously this activity uh, is a version of the show and tell activity that I'm sure lots of you use in your classrooms all the time. You bring an object, you show it to the class and you tell them the story. Um, and that's great. But this idea of just kind of twisting it so that the learners have to come up with um, an, uh, an invented story of their own um, just helps to kind of make it stand out from, from the usual. Uh, it doesn't require materials um, apart from the drawing itself. Okay, this is a very materials free uh, activity. It can work both in the physical classroom um, and also online. So we've just done it online, obviously. Um, in, a, in a class, you would perhaps put students in breakout rooms um, and get them to work with a partner. Uh, they show each other their picture up to the screen and then they have to come up with a story. Um, quite often, uh, you might want to give your learners more, um, more thinking time, more preparation time. Obviously, I put you very much on the spot, but if you wanted this to be um, a more extended speaking activity, perhaps you'd get students to send each other their pictures at the end of one lesson. And then for homework, the task is to come up with a story um, that they then tell their partner in the following lesson. So they've had time to think about the language um, of, of the story. Um, the advantage, so we were talking about the advantage of, of you know, the online versus the being in the physical classroom. Um, the advantage of this, of course, uh, which I found when I've been doing recently, is that you can have the actual object sometimes, you know, if the students are at home, um, they can perhaps bring the actual object and show it to the screen uh, instead of a picture. Um, and there's, uh, it's got a lightness to it. So there's a sense of enjoyment. When you do an activity like this, uh, we learn something about each other. There's a sense of fun. And I think this is really important, um, especially in today's world. Goodness, don't we all need uh, just a little bit of lightness, a little bit of a lift, um, in the lesson and often a creative uh, twist will offer that, that lift. But of course, it is still based on the strong foundations that we were talking about. Um, it easily fits with the language syllabus. Um, you might be doing, I don't know, perhaps descriptive adjectives uh, where you want to describe an object, talk about how it's a bit old or worn or tatty or faded. Um, maybe you're looking at narrative tenses. You know, I got it when, I was in a market in Camden. Um, obviously, you could follow on with a writing activity. Um, but I think that shows you how just a little tweak um, on my favorite possession uh, can lead to an interesting speaking or perhaps writing activity. OK. Um, so the second activity I want to show you is grammar focused. Uh, and I wonder if you can just um, put the answers in the chat for how would we complete these sentences? We've been in a pandemic, March 2020. Or we've been in a pandemic over a year. So the red sentence, <laughs> well done. Okay, so uh, perhaps in your class, you know, you're looking at this um, idea of since and for, you put some sentences on your whiteboard, you um, elicit and you ask your students what's the difference between since or for can they work it out uh, from the sentences I know that you know the answer so I'm not going to uh, go through it so you talk about what the rule is um, that we use since to talk about the start of a period um, and we use for for the length of the period um, and then perhaps you do some you know uh, grammar practice maybe you've done some form uh, written practice um, in the classroom, um, and it's time for some, uh, you want to kind of embed um, the language a little bit more and get them doing some oral practice. Okay, so here's an activity that you could do, uh, and it's based on this idea. I want you, and it's a shame we haven't got everybody with their cameras, but I'm going to ask you to actually do this, okay? Um, if I say a phrase, uh, a time phrase, um, and it uses since, I want you to stand up. So if I was to say uh, last Tuesday, um, I'd like you to actually all stand up. Um, and if uh, I talk about a period, so like a week, um, and it uses four, then I'm gonna ask you to sit down. Okay, 
So, um, and if you're not going to stand up and sit down, then I will allow some people to just, you can write the answer um, in the chat box, up or down. Uh, okay, so I'm going to give you some, some phrases. So the first one is this, it is five o'clock. Five o'clock, is it a stand up or a sit down? Five o'clock. Very good, up. <laughs> So if everybody's standing up, even if you're at home, nobody can see you. Okay. How about a year? A year. Two weeks. Up or down. Two weeks. Twenty nineteen. Oh, okay, you're telling me to stand up. Good. World War II. <laughs> Good. Staying, standing up. Years and years. Okay, telling me to sit down. Years and years. Okay, did any of you do it? Was it just me? <laughs> any of you do the standing up and sitting down? Okay, um, but you get the idea. So uh, these are the phrases that we looked at. So five o'clock, since five o'clock, for a year, for two weeks, since 2019, since World War II, four years and years. We did, <laughs> thank you. You've done your workout for the day, yeah. So, um, okay, so then of course what you can do is you get the learners to do the same thing. So they have to write down maybe um, some phrases, some time phrases, three that use since and three that use for. They write them down um, and then in their group or for the whole of the rest of the class, they say the phrases, the time phrases, and the rest of the class or the group has to stand up or sit down. Um, okay, as a follow on to this, um, you get the learners to, to write some true sentences using since or for. So perhaps um, I've been, I don't know, able to drive for 30 years. Um, I've been in my present job or at my present school since 2012. I've been interested in um, Taekwondo. <laughs> for 10 years, whatever it might be. So they write um, true sentences using the language. And then what they get them to do is to, again, in their group, um, they, uh, you can do this while I'm talking, you could write some sentences in the chat. Um, but in your group, you, they say their sentence and then um, everybody else in the class has to ask them a minimum of three questions about the sentence. So if they say, I've been able to drive since 2002, um, the group has to ask them, oh, are you a good driver? Do you like driving fast? What kind of car do you drive, et cetera? Um, so you're really getting them to, to kind of dig a little bit deeper uh, and use the language more extensively. Okay. Uh, so what is it that um, I really like about this kind of activity? Well, uh, I'm sure you can guess. Um, for me, it's the kinesthetics, it's the movement. Um, so, so often uh, in our classes, you know, we're sat, um, you know, for, a, for an hour. Nowadays, when it's on Zoom, you know, you might be sitting at your desk for hours on end. Um, so I think any chance that you have to get a bit of movement um, in the lesson is really worthwhile. It just helps to kind of change the pace. Um, to get people to kind of get a little bit of viewpoint, to get a bit of oxygen, uh, whatever it might be. But also um, this idea of associating language with movement um, actually helps to embed the learning a little bit more deeply. Okay, uh, so we've done a speaking activity uh, and we've done a grammar activity. Um, and the last activity is um, that I'm going to look at is something that you can do with a text. 
So you've got a reading text or a listening text um, and you want to adapt it for your classroom. Uh, so we're going to look at a story called The Beast. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, perhaps um, when you're working with story uh, with your students, you might start off by showing them some pictures. So you um, look at some pictures on the, on the screen and you get your learners to look at the pictures and see if they can guess what the story is going to be about. Um, now, just look very carefully because the pictures here are going to help you in the activity. So look at each picture uh, and just to yourself think, oh, I wonder what the story's about. The flamingo and the beast. OK, and then I'm going to give you the background. So this is the story so far. Uh, there's a young couple and they're thinking of buying an empty apartment in an old building and the building was rumoured to be haunted, especially the living room of the apartment that they're looking to buy. The couple get permission to spend the night in the apartment. They go into the allegedly haunted room, lock all the doors and windows from the inside. And then the woman in the story uh, tells the story of what happens next. OK, so late that evening, we went into the, and I want you just to write in the chat, um, what you think the next words are. And I'm going to say that you can be as creative as you like. Late, late in the evening, we went into the living room. Nice idea. Just write your ideas in the chat. Could be the bathroom, could be the bedroom, kitchen to get a snack. Nice. Living room. We locked the windows and the door from the inside. We also covered the floor with, covered the floor with, what do you think? <laughs> Flowers, nice. A blanket, see if anybody can get it. Flower, well done, Kiara. Leaves, salt, nice. White flower, just to see if anyone stepped across it. We switched off the lights and settled down into two comfortable chairs. We talked for a while and waited, but nothing happened. Outside, a full moon shone brightly in the night sky. Then, just after midnight, what happened? Just after midnight. Good. Footprint appeared, nice. Someone knocking at the door, a loud thump. The locked door suddenly opened. The locked windows flew open and a strong wind blew into the room. We looked at each other in shock and then we heard a... Scream, cry, howl. Raw, lovely. Terrifying sound like the howl of a wolf. And in the moonlight, we saw in the moonlight, what did we see? A beast, a werewolf. <laughs> Your partner's mother. I love it. In the moonlight, we saw the shape of an enormous beast move across the room and through the wall. The door closed and locked. Very good. Nothing, silence, all was silent. For a few moments, neither of us moved. Then I switched on the light. We looked around the room. Nothing had changed except the... Nothing had changed except the... Good. <laughs> the, flat, the floor. In the flower, on the floor, we saw... You're getting very good. Four footprints of a massive animal. 
ran to the door, shaking with fear. And just before I ran out of the room, I stopped, turned, and what did I do? Remember the pictures. I stopped, turned, and... Now we can really tell who's been concentrating. Tiziana, Emma, Chiara, very nice. <laughs> Catalina, cat appeared. Took some photos of the prints in the floor. We ran out of the building, out into the street, where all was calm and quiet. We stopped to catch our breath. I checked my camera, called up the photos of the beast's footprints. The photos were very clear with the floor covered in white flour, but... Excellent. There were no footprints. Brilliant. I think you should give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> okay. Um, brilliant. So, so this activity, uh, you know, you can do with any kind of reading or listening text. Um, and I hope that you can see that you really um, boost the level of engagement. Okay. Something like this. It's going to be so much more engaging for learners than just um, okay so here's the text you know read the text and then answer the comprehension questions or listen to the text and answer to the comprehension questions um, so you're getting them to do uh, very intensive reading and listening skills um, at the same time often course books uh, separate those two but here we've put the two together um, they're practicing that all important skill of prediction. So predicting the kinds of words that are going to come up next. Um, really, really useful uh, listening skill for our learners to be able to do that. Uh, there's a question about, can you have the slides and materials? Yes, I will be sending you a PDF um, of the presentation. So you will have. Of fun with this they can come up with all sorts of different um, ideas and it doesn't matter that's all part of the activity um, it easily slots into a lesson so again um, this is the kind of activity where you, you take the text that you've got and you can just um, adapt it uh, to work well perhaps you could do it with a text that you'd already covered um, in a previous lesson if you wanted to do some kind of um, you know recycling of, of some of the language and it obviously is going to fit with the language syllabus. Um, so um, you might be here, you could be looking at perhaps descriptive language, um, ing or ed adjectives. So looking at a terrifying sound, uh, or we were terrified, you might look at the difference. Narrative tenses, we switched off the light. Um, you could look at descriptive language, dramatic language for descriptive texts, um, the howl of a wolf, a terrifying sound, a massive animal. Uh, we were shaking with fear. Uh, so there's a question in the chat box about for higher level learners, advanced and proficiency, how would you adapt this? So I think that um, hopefully this shows you, you know, that the, the level of the text can be um, suitable for the higher level learners. Uh, and then, yeah, you could look at some quite high level language, depending on uh, what the focus of your lesson is. Um, OK. Uh, and that's it. So, so that was a, a speaking activity, a grammar activity, um, and then finally a way that you could perhaps adapt uh, a listening or a reading text uh, to work with, um, with your syllabus. So I want to end with kind of two uh, final thoughts. And these come from um, things that teachers often say to me because uh, I'm always talking about creativity and being creative in the classroom. Um, and there are kind of uh, comments that I hear quite regularly from teachers, and I just want to address uh, a couple of those thoughts. So the first one is that quite often teachers will say to me, oh, these are really nice, you know, interesting ideas. I'd love to use them in my classrooms, but I can't really do that in my context. You know, um, I've, I've got, you know, we, ha we have to focus on exams and we just don't have time or, you know, we have to get through the course book or whatever it might be. Uh, and my answer to that is, is this really, that um, there is an element of defiance uh, when you're being creative, okay? If you 
um, think it's important for your learners, you will find a way of doing it. So the classroom is your space. What happens within that lesson, uh, you do have some control over that. Um, so I think there's always a way, um, even when we do have a very kind of pressured syllabus, you know, as I hope you can see from some of these examples, it doesn't have to take long. Sometimes it can literally be a two or three minute um, twist or tweak on an activity, something uh, that you can bring into the class that's just going to help provide that hook for memory, that's just going to engage your learners um, and, and help things kind of stick out in their mind. So, yes, there is an element of confidence and courage, um, but I, I think we need to have that as teachers. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, teachers quite often say to me, oh, you know, that those are lovely ideas. You have so many ideas, Antonia, but you're a really creative person. Um, and so it's easy for you to come up with these ideas, but I, I'm just not very creative. You know, I'm, I, I, I don't know how to draw and I, I don't have all of these ideas. Um, and my answer to that is, you know, that's fine. Um, creativity isn't about having, you know, we don't all have to be the genius, the Picasso and the Mozart. We, we can work on other people's ideas. You know, if you don't have lots of ideas yourself, fine. Creativity is a collaborative act. So you pick up an idea in a workshop like this um, or in a workshop with your, you know, a uh, face to face workshop with the people in your school. Or perhaps you read it in an article uh, or in a book. You take an idea. Um, it might just be small. You can start small. You bring it into your classroom. You try it out and you adapt it. Um, this is how we kind of build up our, our repertoire. Um, we're always, you know, there's nothing new in, in, uh, in teaching English. I always think, you know, the same things get kind of rehashed and changed um, over the years. Uh, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's we build on what has gone before. We stand on the shoulders of, of giants in a way. So um, creativity is, is very much, I think, a, a collaborative um, effect. And, and, and also with your learners, OK, each time you do an activity in a different class, it's going to be slightly different. Um, OK, so uh, I hope that encourages you to just um, have the confidence to kind of move out of your comfort zone, do things a little bit differently sometimes. Um, I think it's important to think that, you know, think back to your own teaching experience, uh, learning experience when you were at school. You know, there were probably lots of different teachers that you had. Uh, some that you got on with better than others, but I'm sure there was always one teacher that stood out, um, that really connected with you on a personal level. And that will have been the more creative teacher, the teacher who, who um, took that extra effort to, to connect with you um, and take a real interest in you uh, personally. So uh, you need to go out and be that flamingo uh, for your learners. OK, these are the things we've been talking about. Six reasons to be creative in class. Um, they're there. I'm not going to go through them, but it's this idea of um, really making the learning more meaningful um, and deeper, involving your emotions um, and engaging the learners, helping uh, the information to stand out from the ordinary, but also that it nourishes us as teachers. OK, when we're creative in the classroom, we get interesting results that we weren't expecting. Um, that feeds into our own professional development. It's motivating for us. Um, and so we, we tend to seek out uh, more ideas for ways of doing things differently. And it's really what we all need in the world, that lift um, of doing things a little bit differently, not knowing what, uh, what to expect, I think is really important. Uh, so in terms of strong foundations, obviously, um, you can work with a syllabus. Um, and many of you will know me from, from Speak Out, and I think uh, Pearson's going to be talking about some of our products later. Um, if you're interested in any of the more kind of creative ways to work on that syllabus, um, this is a book that I've written recently with a, uh, my co-author, Alan Marsh. It's called The Creative Teacher's Compendium, which is an A to Z uh, of activities for the classroom. Um, so go away and enjoy yourselves and thank you so much.